Good morning, everyone. Hope you're having a fantastic day. I'm gonna try wearing a patch. A few people complained about the fact that I always get on the show and confirm the stream is working, so you know what? We're not gonna do that anymore. Instead, you're gonna be subjected to an ad. Hope you're happy. Um, we're currently having a sale for pokercoaching.com. You can get three years for only $300. Think of the value, right? We also give tons and tons of bonuses. You get to pick whichever bonuses you want, which is great for you. If you don't even know what bonuses you want, because I have over 50 different bonuses, um, you can send me an email explaining your situation, and I will personally tell you which ones I think are best for you. I try to make it good for you. I try to give you exactly what you need to improve your skills at poker so you can, so you can win more money and so you can better your life. James has been crying today. I don't know why. He's been, he's been crying a bit the last few days. We let Thomas sleep train last night. First day, Amy and I slept on the couch. Thomas is sleeping in our room in his crib. We took his crib um, out of James's room and put it in his, his own room now, so I don't have a bedroom anymore. But that's okay, I don't need one. And um, he cried for like 30 minutes and went to sleep. Amy says he woke up and whimpered some during the night, but hey, that's okay. I'd sign. And um, one day down, one to go. Are cash games better than tournament players? Depends on at what game you're referring to. Cash game players are certainly better at cash games than tournament players. Um, cash game players are very often worse than tournament players at tournaments. Who'd have thought, right? The games are different. It's important to understand that different game structures are different games. They're not the same. Um, very often, you see cash game players do very well in the early levels of a tournament. And then they do poorly in the late levels. Who'd have thought? They do very well with deep stacks. They do very poorly with shallow stacks. That's because quite often they don't have experience in that and they haven't studied that as much, right? Um, I mean, across the board, I would typically say like the best cash game players are pretty much equally good as the best tournament players in terms of total skill sets. But you have to understand, to be very good at cash games, you have to be very good at one form of poker, one stack size for the most part. Maybe two, either 100 big blinds poker or deeper, like 200 big blind, 400 big blind poker, right? For tournaments, you have to be decently good at a lot of different big blind levels, like 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, all the way up to 200. You don't have to be the best at any of them, but you have to be very well-rounded. I think you're going to see the difference in that um, cash game players are very specified. They have one very clear skill set, whereas tournament players are not so specified. Like, they can play all the different stack sizes reasonably well. All right. So, today, we had a request for the topic. Tips for your first World Series of Poker. I have um, infinite tips. I've actually made a four-hour webinar on this in the past. We're not going to be here for four hours. But um, we'll give you some basic tips. Tim says, what's better for building a bankroll? Grinding micros or taking a shot in tournaments? Go to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash bankroll. Essentially, grind it up. Don't try to get lucky. Getting lucky is a great way to ruin your life. Try to figure that one out. I would definitely say most poker players who started off doing poorly their first year of playing high-variance poker have fared way better long-term than those who ran way above expectation because they knew what was practical and realistic. If you sit down and you instantly win a tournament, you're going to think, oh my god, I'm great at poker. Then you're going to spew off all your money playing a game you don't have an edge out. This happens to so many players every year. They play $1,000 tournaments. They win one. They get hundred k to their name. They jump into $10,000 tournaments. Maybe they win one of those two. Now they have a million dollars to their name. And then they blow it all over the next two or three years trying to continue playing bigger and bigger, thinking that that is what they're supposed to do. Whereas in reality, they're probably barely winning $1,000 buying tournament players and they're just getting crushed. Anyway, first tips, tips for first time World Series of Poker players. First things first, what are your goals? A lot of people go to the World Series without actually knowing what they are trying to accomplish. Most people want to think, I'm trying to win a bracelet. Well, that's not actually your goal. Because if it was, what would you do? What if your only goal in life was to win a bracelet? Well, you would sell all of your belongings, liquidate everything you own. You would then take it all to Vegas, and you would play very small fielded tournaments, which are going to be a bunch of mixed games, which means you're going to be playing mixed game events. I highly doubt most people who say, I want to win a bracelet, think I'm going to liquidate everything I own, 
and go play super high stakes tournaments. So that is not actually your goal. Get that out of your mind. If you think that's your goal, you're lying to yourself. So now, what is actually your goal? First off, you may or may not want to actually go broke, right? Most people don't want to go broke when they go to the World Series. Most people who are recreational players grind all year and then take that money and use it to buy into World Series events. I know a lot of people, they win like 5 or 10K each year in their local games. They take it all to Vegas. If they win, they win. If they lose, they lose. They don't care because they want to have a shot. First off, in my mind, like pigeonholing money to a specific thing is kind of silly. Um, that said, a lot of people do it. But let's say you do decide, I'm going to grind hard all year and then probably blow it in Vegas. That's what we've decided to do. Okay, next you want to ask, do I, am I going out for just one tournament or am I going out for many tournaments? If I'm going out for many tournaments, do I actually want to play a lot or do I want to play only a few specific tournaments? Like, for example, if your goal is to win a bracelet with the money that you have, let's say 10K you want over the year, well, clearly you should give yourself a lot of decent shots at that, right? So you can play a lot of $500,000 World Series events. It's a decent idea. Understanding you're probably going to get one min cash out of about nine or 10 or eight or seven, something like that. So you're going to go out with 10K, you're probably going to come home with one or two or three or four or zero. That's the reality of it. So is that good for you? Are you happy going out with 10, probably coming back with two? A lot of people are because they don't care. They want to try to win a bracelet. Other people, though, they go out there with 10,000 and want to have a decent chance of actually turning a profit. Well, you do that by playing lots and lots of small tournaments. Like at, um, well, name, name any casino besides the Rio, pretty much. Um, a lot of tournaments have daily tournaments. They're, they're not called daily tournaments. They have like a $500 tournament each day that has only 300 people or 500 people. And you have a way better chance of winning those tournaments than you do a 5,000 person World Series of Poker event, right? So it's very important to understand what your goals are. If you just take your $10,000 out there and splash it around as hard as you can, well, I've seen many people do that. The, the best players in their region, by the way, people who win the, home, win the games all the time where they're from, and then they go and they play a few tournaments, they lose 5,000 out of the 10,000, next thing you know, they're in the blackjack pit, and they're broke almost every time. It's not what you want to do. Presuming you actually care about giving yourself the best chance to win. Speaking of that, are you on a vacation or are you on a poker trip? Or are you on both? A lot of people say, oh, I'm on both. I think it's a little bit silly to do both, especially in a city like Vegas, where all of your options are available, right? When you go to Vegas, you can party hard, you can eat fancy dinners, you can go to clubs, you can do all the drugs, you can gamble your butt off, you can wind up in a gutter in the morning, you know, you can do whatever you want in Vegas. And for that reason, I suggest if you're going on a vacation, realize you're going to go on a vacation, you're probably going to give away your money, as everyone who goes on vacation to Vegas does. And then um, you're probably not going to win at poker. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with going on a vacation to Vegas and playing one or two World Series events and hoping to get lucky. Or going out there and partying all night and drinking all day and playing $200 tournaments and praying to get lucky. Nothing wrong with that. You're not going to win money, but there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but assuming you're actually going out there to try to win at poker, you need to be very disciplined. You need to have a very strict plan. Obviously, things can change, right? Like, let's say you go out there with your $10,000, and you're going to play daily $200 and $500 tournaments, and you win one. You go out there, you started with um, $10,000, next thing you know, you have $50,000. Well, you know, maybe your plan changes. Maybe you decide to gamble a little bit harder, play $1,000 World Series events, and that's A-OK. -okay. Um, but in general, if things are going poorly, you should not all of a sudden start ramping up your volume, because usually when things are going poorly, you are prone to tilt, and... You have a smaller bankroll. So when you are prone to tilt, you want to play smaller or not at all. When you have a smaller bankroll, you want to play smaller. So that's not a reason to play bigger. Um, something else some people do is they go out there with their $10,000. They're going to play for a week or two. If they have $10,000 at the end of the trip, they're going to throw it into the main event and pray to get lucky. Again, nothing wrong with that. Just realize you are straight up gambling. And um, putting all of your profits from here on one tournament drastically increases your variance, and that will lead you going broke almost every time. So you should probably not do that. Let's see. Do you actually care about taking some money home? You really should ask yourself that because if you go out there and you play 40 tournaments in two weeks, you're going to take home some money way more often than if you go out there and you play 10 tournaments, assuming you're going to invest your whole amount of money, just because you will get some cashes over 40 tournaments, right? So if you care about having some chance to take home some money, like a decent amount, you know, like as you play more, you're going to get closer and closer to your actual ROI. 
So let's say even if you're a losing player, minus 10%. If you go out there and you play 40 tournaments, I mean, I'm not going to say you're going to be exactly minus 10%, but it's going to be like minus 50 or plus a lot. Whereas if you play 10 tournaments, you're going to be like minus 90 or plus a lot, right? And um, that's important for you to consider. Let's see, everyone keeps talking to Paul. What is Paul asking? If you want to strictly study cash games, will poker coaching help you? It definitely will. Many, many, many of our homework challenges and quizzes discuss deep stacked poker. All right, so if you think you're playing well enough to actually run deep in one of those tournaments, you play in a world, you play in the World Series. Um, boom, I'm not sure what, that's not a question. Um, let's see. Louis Philippe says, one of your employees is a maniac and he cashed his very first event. Good. Now he's hooked for life. All right, let's see. You totally want to play a $400 event at the World Series, but you only have $1,400 in your bankroll. Well, Stu, it would be wise for you to stay home and play in the softer games. Let's talk about that reality, too. A lot of the best pros have realized what during the World Series, you want to be anywhere besides Vegas. Why? Because... All of the decently good players from your local area go to Vegas. So the games locally become way softer than normal. Way, way, way softer than normal. Which is great, especially if you sit there and plan on grinding it out hard. There are even some places, um, I know Borgata did this for a time or two, where they have a series that's at the exact same time as the World Series. So all the good players are gone. It's just a bunch of fish playing the $300 tournaments. It's fantastic if that's what your goals are. So understand... I understand there's an allure to going to Vegas, but just because there is an allure to this does not mean that you have to go and do it, right? So be aware that just because a game exists does not mean you have to play it. So many people get wrapped up in, I don't know the right word, probably prestige, something like that, where they just want to do what other people are doing. But in reality, doing what other people are doing is very often not the ideal way to succeed. Quite often, you want to be doing the opposite of what people are doing. I mean, you see um, all the kids focusing on streaming on Twitch, but um, we're focusing our efforts elsewhere, right? One thing you all may not know is that I focus a lot of efforts on email. Email marketing is where it's at. Not a lot of these other places. YouTube's very good as well. That's something that a lot of poker sites have not quite figured out yet, but they will eventually. And um, till then, we're just going to keep Doing great there. All right, let's see. You've been to Vegas, never really played live tournaments. You have a budget you was willing to lose to get experience and practice. You had a really good time. Now you feel comfortable in these events. Um, yeah, I mean, again, Jack, this is these situations where you have to ask, like, what are my goals, right? In my mind, if you want to succeed long-term, well, first off, go read jonathanlowpoker.com slash bankroll. But um, you need to understand that if you, let's say you win 10000 in a year, if you just do that for 10 years and don't blow it in Vegas every year, you'll have 100 k in 10 years. Assuming you never move up. Assuming you have only the same winner. You don't get any better. And the odds of you coming out of Vegas with 100 k at any point is very, 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 very low. So you have to be disciplined. Just because the World Series exists does not mean you have to play it. Is it smart to set a schedule of mixing in cash games and tournaments? We're going to talk about that in a bit. You think it's possible to cash in the first World Series event? I mean, sure, it's certainly possible, but I mean, it's the same odds as your second event, your third event, your fourth event for the most part. I mean, if, you have to understand every event you play are like 15-ish percent to cash, so it is it is what it is. It's just math, right? 99% says you've got a Airbnb with 25k budget and to turn a profit is your goal. If you want to turn a profit, just play cash games. Because then, swings are going to be way smaller, right? You're going on a motorhome, right? Have fun with that. Uh, let's see. One time you went to Vegas, you was looking to work and only played poker once. And all the other time, you was looking for a job. You're happy it didn't work out because you ended up having your daughter back home. Not sure exactly what that means, but okay. All right, let's see. Let's continue moving forward here. Um, when you do go to Vegas, let's say you are going to go play World Series poker tournaments or soft daily tournaments. Speaking of which, Russ says, where are the soft daily tournaments? Everywhere. Literally everywhere. If you walk into a casino, they're going to have a soft daily tournament. But mainly Wynn, uh, Planet Hollywood, Aria sometimes. 
Venetian, but I typically don't play there because they're, they they hate online poker. I mean, really, just name any casino. Walk in there, they'll have a tournament for you. It'll be good. Um, you need to enjoy yourself, right? Let's say we do go, and we're going to play, and we're going to play every day. We're going to have a, a reasonably strict schedule. We're going to wake up. We're going to be productive. We're going to go play poker. Make sure you still have fun, right? Now, I don't know exactly what fun means to you, but if you do go out there for like a week or two, you may end up getting burnt out very quickly, especially if you're not used to um, grinding that hard all day, every day. So you may find that if you do get burnt out, you need to take some time to do whatever you like to do. You can go hiking in Vegas. You can go, um, they have all sorts of indoor activities. Probably don't want to stay outside too long in the valley because you'll bake your brain, but you need to make sure you have fun. You know, if you enjoy nice dinners, go out and get a nice dinner. If you enjoy going to shows, go out and see some shows, right? There are lots of things that you can do. Let's talk poker hands. This is my show. We get to talk about whatever I want to talk about. You flop a set and you get it all in. Your opponent gets there. That's fine. Sometimes you're going to lose. Don't fold full houses. If you fold full houses on queen, 10, 4, queen, you're a fish. It's okay to lose. We don't talk about bad beats here because bad beats are irrelevant. Everyone loses in the bad beats, and if you're folding the effective nuts, you're literally never going to win. All right, let's see. Um, one thing also worth mentioning. Imagine you do have, let's say, 15K to your name, but you, have, you won 10K last year. You're going to take all your 10K to Vegas. You're going to have an emotional breakdown a lot of the time at some point, assuming you care about the money, which most people do. I mean, I would certainly not go out to Vegas with $3 million and think I'm going to lose it all or get rich. That would be ridiculous. Assuming I could even play like million dollar buying tournaments every day if I wanted. Uh, that would be ridiculous because clearly you're going to have emotional trauma if you're losing two thirds of your bankroll almost every time. So understand that playing well within your bankroll is going to be highly, highly, highly beneficial for you because... You're just not going to feel the emotional swings, the emotional turmoil that comes from blasting it off, right? So playing within your bankroll will help you have a good time and help you enjoy yourself. Because if you are bankrolled to play, let's say, $500 tournaments, and you're playing $500 tournaments and you lose, well, it's just not a big deal, right? Because you're probably going to lose. But if you're out there and you're just blasting like a lunatic, then, well, you're, you're probably going to have a tough time. So playing within your bankroll will help. I also get an email every single day, it seems. I'm going to play a big tournament tomorrow. What should I do? Well, the answer is you should have studied ahead of time, right? Go to PokerCoaching.com, PokerCoaching.com. You can get a completely free trial. Go there. Go through all of the past homework challenges. You can binge watch it, then cancel. I don't care. I want you all to get good at poker and better your lives. And learning to play and think in a fundamentally sound manner will ensure you have a great chance of success. So... Study ahead of time. Don't send me an email saying, oh my gosh, I'm playing a big tournament tomorrow. What should I do? If you're asking me that, you're not prepared. And, well, you're you're certainly not going to have a big edge, that's for sure. Um, what is a good in the money percentage? And what's an excellent in the money percentage? They're about the same number. They're both about 15 to 20%, assuming 15% of the field gets paid. You may say, why is it the same? Shouldn't you want to cash more? No! Go to jonathanlowpoker.com slash bankroll and read that. Apparently you haven't done that yet. It is well known that people who cash the most are the biggest losers. You say, what? I thought cashing was good. Well, you have to understand that when you min cash a lot, you're essentially giving up the potential to win in exchange for getting a minimum cash. The goal is definitely not to get a minimum cash. The goal is to get a cash for 100 buy-ins. Min caching is not a good result. Whenever you see people clapping because they get in the money, everyone clapping you know, cares way too much about the money. Have I ever brought up, brought a laptop computer set up on the road to grind online? Or do I separate the two? I mean, no, I definitely grind online whenever I'm playing, especially in Europe. Like, I'm not going to do it in the World Series just because the games aren't very big. But online, I definitely do it. Um, are there any online World Series, are the online World Series bracelet events softer than the live ones? No, definitely not. Live tournaments are very tough, although I do bet those events are softer than the generic um, online tournaments. All right, let's see. So yeah, study ahead of time. If you go out there and you're thinking, I don't know what I'm doing, well, realize you're just gambling. And again, 
There is nothing wrong with gambling, but I'm trying to teach you all to win money from poker. And you don't do that by just gambling and splashing around. Um, so I mentioned having fun. This is very important. Very, very important. Everyone pay attention. This is going to save you um, either a little bit or up to your entire life. You need to avoid your vices. I don't know what your individual vices are. Some people like to gamble too hard. Some people like to drink too much. Some people like to do drugs too much. Some people like to spend all their money on clubs. Some people like spending $400 a meal on fancy dinners. Some people like buying fancy shoes. Some people stay up all night and then are just dead the next day and they try to play dead and they don't pay attention. All of these things are vices that will make you go broke. I did a video with Mike Sexton and he said that um, one of the old time grinders says, if you go to Vegas and you have one leak, well, maybe you can survive. But if you have two, you are just stone dead. And that's true. Um, my vices in the past have been drinking too much and gambling on sports and or casino games, mainly blackjack. And I eradicate those, especially during the World Series of Poker, because these things not only lose you money, just straight up lose you money, they also suck away your energy and focus. Imagine even new. Let's say I could go out there and play blackjack and bet on sports and win $10,000 on the summer. But I was going to spend 10 hours doing it, which is actually not that long. And I was going to make 1000 bucks an hour. It's a pretty good win rate, right? Mm. Thomas wants to say hello. He's interrupting my important um, talk. Realize, though, that you're going to spend your time focusing on those things instead of poker. And if you spend your time focusing on um, gambling instead of playing poker, what's going to happen is you are going to lose your, you're going to lose your focus. And, I mean, I spent plenty of days watching a sporting event or sweating it on my phone while I was playing a poker tournament. And that is stupid. Young Jonathan Little was dumb as he could be. It's a miracle, miracle that we are still here today. But I had to eradicate these things from my life because if I didn't, my life would have been ruined. And um, I don't know if any of you are quite as degenerate as I am, but if you are, you have to get rid of your vices, especially during Vegas time, because that is when you can really go off. Mm. Here's a book I enjoy. Personal Organization for Degenerates. It's just you check it out. It's by a guy, Brandon Adams. Very smart guy. I like him a lot. And um, that'll help you manage your life if you do have degenerate tendencies like myself and many other great poker players. Mm. So, avoid your vices, please. That is the best life tip I could possibly give you. Next, um, get some sleep, right? Uh, you know, I mentioned the vice of staying up all night playing for forever, but even if you don't do that, like say you're, you end up playing till like 4 a.m. and then playing a tournament at noon, well, you're probably going to end up tired and not focused by the end of the series. And that's a big problem because you need to be able to focus. What are you looking at? What are you looking at? Ugh, stand up. You're too heavy. You're too heavy. Stand up, please. No, nope, not going to stand up. You're going to make me carry you. Hello. Hello. He normally likes me, but I think he's not enjoying my office because it's really hot in here. For those who don't know, it's like 100 degrees in here. It's a sauna. And um, I sit in the sauna all day. The good news for bad poker players is that you won't play any worse when drinking. <laughs> for the rest of us, one drink is too many and two is ridiculous. Um, yeah, sure. Slots with the devil, yes. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Look. Please, I mean, I know none of you are going to listen to me, but you must avoid your vices. And you know what they are. You need to be honest with yourself. If you are doing anything too much at all, you have to be well under control. Um, so yeah, eat right, sleep right, keep your life under control. The easiest way to do this, in my opinion, is to set a bedtime. Your bedtime, my bedtime at least, is midnight or as soon as I'm done with the tournament for the day, which will end up being something like... Um, 1 a.m. at the latest, or maybe 2 a.m. at the latest. So, that is a pretty good strategy. You have a bedtime. You go to bed at your bedtime. And um, that's it. That'll keep you on a good schedule. Also, sign up for All American Dave's food package. It's going to cost you about $20 a meal. I know it's not cheap, but if you go out there, you're going to... What they do is they essentially deliver healthy foods to your table. I'm sure the food probably costs like $3 to make. But, oh, hi. 
You don't like All-American Daves? Why not? Why not? Oh, who's this? It's Amy. Is that all for you? It's too hot in here. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Go sign up for All-American Daves. It's going to cost you about 1000 bucks or 600 bucks, And then you don't have to think about food at the table. So you'll eat there twice a day. You'll show up at noon or whenever the tournament starts, 11, whatever. I order a meal to be there as soon as I arrive. Now, how do I know where I'm going to be seating? Or sitting? Sitting. <laughs> how do I know where I'm going to be sitting? I sign up a day ahead of time for almost every tournament I play. That's going to allow you to not wait in lines. Waiting in lines is for fish, and it's very easy to avoid waiting in lines. If you know you're going to have to wait in a line, just sing on straight. If you know you're going to have to wait in a line, you should um, make sure you're utilizing your time in the line well by reading a book or listening to a podcast. Don't just stand there and waste your time, right? Utilize your time well in all aspects of life. So anyway, I show up. Um, I have the food ready to be delivered to my table like 15 minutes after the tournament starts. That way I don't have to worry about breakfast in the morning, which saves time again, right? And then also, um, I'll usually have dinner at dinner break. I'll just um, have something ordered as well. Maybe I'll get a smoothie during the day too. They can deliver that to you. Anyway, it's nice and convenient. It's so, so convenient. And this is one of the things I think you just have to pay for. It's a little bit silly to not pay for it. Um, where's the best place to stay during the entire series? I often stay at Palm's place. I have to figure out if I want to give you all of my tricks. I stay in the one bedroom places at Palm's place. I'm already booked for this year, so you can't take that. But um, it's nice. I think it's $130 a day, give or take, which is, you know, a little pricey, but certainly not super expensive. It's right close to the Rio. It's a four-minute car ride away. Um, they have a cafe there that you can get lunch at. It's pretty good. So it's it's a pretty solid option. It's not too expensive. If I had my choice, I'd say Mandarin Oriental, but we're not rich enough for that yet. What's my biggest sports bet? <laughs> I don't even know. I don't know, 50K, something like this? A solid, solid amount. We, we have problems here. What are proper adjustments to local casinos where everybody's super deep stacked? Well, try to make hands that are good when deep stacked. Am I afraid to die? No, not really. I'm probably too young to be thinking about that at the most part, for the most part. And um, fortunately, we're not there yet. What are the importance, what considerations can you make on the importance of table configuration? I don't even know what that means. Um, so yeah, you want to make sure you eat right, get good sleep, and work out a little bit. So another thing I will do is let's say I know I'm going to go to bed at midnight. I'll wake up at like 9 a.m., maybe 10 a.m., and then I will go to the gym. Wake up, roll out of bed, have coffee, go to the gym, do that for a little bit. I don't go too hard during the World Series. I'm not trying to get ripped during the World Series. That's not the goal. The goal is to just stay in reasonable shape. And I think that's probably the best way to go about it. You don't want to make, you don't want to be, um, tired at the end of the day, right? If you're like burning a ton of calories in the morning, you're going to be pretty white by 1 a.m. if it comes to that. So you know, just do like light workouts four or five days a week. I think that's a pretty good strategy. What's the name of the hotel? It's actually a condominium. It's called Palms Place. They have kitchens in them. The one bedrooms are significantly bigger than the studios and much nicer in my opinion. It's more like an actual house. Dutch says 50k is a problem. Haha. Ha. Well, it depends on how much money you have, right? Also depends on if you have an edge. And funny enough, even though I have fared roughly break even in um, sports, I think I probably had a bigger edge or probably just ran poorly. It's tough to say though, right? That's, sports are a funny thing because unless you put in like infinite volume, because you have to understand you're playing with like 1% ROI if you're good. If you're playing with 1% ROI, you know how long it takes to get a real sample on that? I only made, I don't know, 10,000 bets. Whereas in reality, you need like a million bets. That's the problem with the game is that you just can't get in a lot of volume. You can, get a lot of, you can get a lot of dollars down, which is really nice. You can't get a lot of dollars down in poker. That's the problem with poker, by the way, is you can play a lot, but you can't actually invest a lot. But um, in sports betting, you can get a lot of money down, but you still can't put in that many actual bets, which leads to very high variance. Um, but, I mean, the, the issue with, with sports betting for me was not that I was losing money. The issue was that I was losing focus and losing time in exchange for, like, 1% ROI, Right? And, I mean, obviously losing money is bad. Like, if you're playing degenerate gambling games and losing money, that's clearly terrible. But if you are good at them, like, I am, I mean, I know I'm up at blackjack, and I know I'm break-even at sport betting. 
at these two things, it's fine, but it takes the focus. And focus is vitally important when playing poker. Um, most casinos have a poker rate. Yeah, um, so if you go to the Rio, tell them you're playing the World Series, they'll give you a cheap rate. There, there are a lot of places you can stay in. Typically, as I'm staying for a shorter period of time, I stay in a crappier place. So stay, as I'm staying longer and longer, I stay at a nicer place. Where do you play cash during the series? I actually haven't played cash the last few years. I've played almost entirely tournaments and sit-and-goes. They have $1,000 sit-and-goes at the World Series that are very nice. But I've tried to play at Bellagio and Aria the last few years, and either the games are relatively tough, in the high stakes at least, or um, the list is a mile long and you're never going to get in. So I have not had great success even... I haven't had great success getting in good games is what it amounts to. As turns out, no good pros have success getting in good games because of the advent of these private games. So it's a bit of a problem. Am I going to play the Big 50? Nope. We discuss this every single episode now, it seems. I'll tell you why. Imagine I'm going to have a 200% ROI in the tournament, which I probably don't. That means I'm going to make $1,000 in a day, or maybe a day and a half. That means I'm going to make, let's say, let's say I'm going to make $1,000 a day. Well, I personally would rather sit and play 5 to no limit or play sit and goes and make the same amount or maybe more. And also I have the ability to work from home and make that much money as well. So I don't need to go and play that tournament. It's not a good use of my time. And at this point in my life, my goal is not to win a bracelet. My goal is not necessarily even to maximize dollars. My goal is to maximize enjoyment. And the idea of being at the Rio when it's a madhouse with millions of people is not my idea of a good time. So I'm not playing that. And we discussed this previously where I'm playing the beginning few tournaments and the World Poker Tour Tournament of Champions, etc., etc. Uh, beginning, then I'm coming home, then I'm going to play all the bigger stuff at the end. Let's see. You're enjoying the YouTube videos. Good, I'm glad you like them. What is the best tournament series to play? The main events? The main event's always a soft one. Are World Series of Poker events considered soft? Absolutely. I mean, look, again, the terms of soft is very relative, like dollars are relative, right? If you are a $500 tournament player, World Series of Poker Circuit events may be tough for you. If you are a $25,000 high roller player, World Series Circuit events are going to be incredibly soft to you. And that's all that really matters, right? It's like, what is your relative skill level? So the idea of, are they soft, is not a good question, because are they soft to who? Any advice on big field tournaments? Um, play normal? I don't know. Is late registering an option? It's not a good option. You should almost always register on time. Because the bad players show up on time to play, and you want to play with bad players. Also, on average, bad players get knocked out before the good players, just because of how poker works. And therefore, as the tournament goes longer and longer, you're playing against better and better players on average. How can one prepare for a tournament series when working full-time? Set priorities. Full-time is only 40 hours a week, right? It's a lot more hours in a week than 40. Man, these kids are crying like crazy out there. Maybe I should go tell them. Can you all hear the kids crying? Am I making another audiobook anytime soon? No. Maybe. 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 Soon, maybe like a year. When can you get poker coaching gear slash patches? Patches will be coming up soon. Gear may be a little bit longer. Just because gear is like a whole... It's a whole process. Whereas patches, they're already made and they're done. All right. Let me go tell these kids to be quiet. I'll tell everyone. Wife said it's not possible to make the children be quiet. They're just going to yell. Um, okay. Oh, the question. Cash games versus tournaments versus sit and goes, etc., etc. Whenever I go out there, my general strategy, which is not the one that wins the most money, by the way, my strategy is to play the tournament every day, whatever tournament I'm going to play. These are usually... $3,000 buying World Series events and higher. And then in my spare time, I usually play sit and goes, $1,000 buying sit and goes, or bigger if they have them at the World Series. And also I do other things, like we have meetups. We're having two breakfasts this summer, by the way, for members of pokercoaching.com. So if you're a member to those, you will get a completely free breakfast for me if you want. So stay tuned for that. Um, so I have a lot of stuff going on, right? I have a, a booth there that is part of uh, that that is run by my publishing company dnb poker so i'm there a lot of the time signing books and hanging out etc etc so i do lots more than just exactly play poker 
Um, also, I need to relax some, so I make a point to relax a little bit. And um, I'm not trying to play all day every day. If your goal is, though, again, what are your goals, right? Do you want to play all the tournaments? Again, ask yourself why. If you have an ego problem because you want to play the tournaments to try to prove yourself or something, well, it's probably not ideal. But if you are playing it because you think it's a good use of your time, then it's probably fine. And then if you assume you make less at cash games but still some, then um, just do it in your spare time, right? But again, set a bedtime. I think that's a really good strategy. Even if the game's good, I typically pack it up and leave. But I mean, if your goal is to go out there and only play cash games, then your hour should be, I don't know, 6 p.m. till 6 a.m. or something like that. And that's fine. I can get your ebook signed. I'm happy to sign any ebooks you would like. Do I ever come to Minnesota to play? No. Do you ever leave the World Series with profit? Mm, I think I've profited like four out of 10 years, which is probably about right. Maybe 11 years, 12 years, I don't know. The, the idea of profit over a short time period, like the World Series, doesn't compute in my brain. I'm trying to win over like a 10 year period because I understand 10 years is only what? 3,000 tournaments? 3,000 tournaments is nothing. So I don't really care if I went over any sort of 40 tournament sample. I have had two very bad World Series where I had zero caches. Zero out of like 35 or 40 tournaments. And um, if you talk to every good pro, they're going to have the exact same results where you just run poorly. But again, caches don't matter. What matters is are you winning? I was always lucky in those spots though because I won a World Poker Tour right before or right after. So makes makes life makes life easy that I've ran relatively consistent. Um, what made me decide to start making content? Oh my gosh, that was a long time ago. For those who don't know, I've had um, a site a long time ago called Sit and Go Icons. I was one of the best Sit and Go players, and I decided to help people because I got good because other people helped me. Without their help, I would certainly not be where I am today. And I guess you just feel the need to give back, right? And I'm certainly not out for myself. I'm not sure why I'm not out just for myself. If I was, I would be doing very different things. But I like helping people who want to better their lives. And I wanted to do this a long time ago. I've been making content now for, I don't know, 12 years, something like that. I mean, a lot of people who are in the poker world are relatively new to the game. and They don't quite understand how long some people have been around. And they also don't realize how like relatively new some people are. I mean, it's always interesting to me because I pay attention to YouTube a decent amount because I make a lot of content there. But there's like a new video blogger, new content creator every week, and they're gone a year later almost every time. And I don't know why I have longevity, but I think it's because I enjoy what I do. I'm not doing it to try to get rich. A lot of people get into making content with the idea of I'm going to get rich or famous. And um, I'll tell you a little secret, you're not going to get rich or famous unless you do it for a very long time and you love it. Fortunately, I've been doing it a very long time and I love it and it's paying off, but... I mean, I have a few unfair advantages. Number one, I started a long time ago, so I started developing a fan base before everyone else. Second, I actually have very good poker results. A lot of people don't, right? These are two huge unfair advantages. What are the other advantages? Well, if you start earlier, you ideally start generating money sooner, which allows you to hire better resources or utilize the resources better than other people. Um, there's some downsides, though. You may start to get behind the curve, especially if you get comfortable. I've made a point to never be comfortable because if you get comfortable and think you're doing great, that is when you get overpassed. Or overpassed? That's when you get passed by. And you certainly don't want to get passed by, so then you want to have longevity. So we continue working hard, continue trying to improve and iterate. And um, that's it. Continue seeking help from people who are better than you. And that's what I've always done in poker and in life. Yeah, why do I do this? I don't know, because I like it. Pay it forward. Yeah, you should be paying it forward. That's exactly it. If um, you have been helped by people, you should help people going forward. I mean, I have, I have mentors who are like crushing life. As, I mean, as decent as I am doing, these people are like, they're multimillionaires or billionaires and they have a good family. They have a good job. They have life under control. And I don't know why, but they're willing to help me. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm willing to help people, especially in the poker space, who I actually have a significant amount of information on the space. I'm happy to help people in that space. I'm gonna go tell her to make that baby be quiet again. One second. Excuse me, can you make this baby be quiet? I'm
kidding, it's a joke, it's a joke. It's a joke, it's a joke. And he says, I know you think you're funny, but not so much. Um, <laughs> you can hear the kids, but it's not a big issue. Fortunately, slash unfortunately, you have to hear the kids. Everyone can use a mentor. They can. Fortunately for everyone, we live in a world where people out there who have done very well are willing to sit down and talk with you. Maybe not one-on-one, -on -one, maybe one to 8,000 like we do here. Completely for free. And it, it costs you literally nothing, just a little bit of time. So I know some of you are here every day, presumably because you either enjoy it or you get something out of it. I mean, enjoyment is something you can get out of it. Maybe you get advice as well. I don't know. But um, I, I listen to tons of podcasts. It's like you're listening to people give you their best tips on life about the topics that you actually care about. I mean, what, what more do you want in life, right? And I definitely don't think you necessarily need one-on-one -on -one mentors at this point in life well in this point in the world because now you can get so much information virtually where you just learn a ton i mean every, this whole business i've built not the poker playing business but the educational business has come because i have learned it from other people and because i've benefited from it right and hopefully you all do that as well what frustrates you and your coaching students? People who ask the same questions over and over again and don't improve. Maybe I shouldn't be doing a morning show where I get the same questions over and over again. Um, it is good, though, because whenever you get the same questions over and over again, you know the common problems, right? Like, I get so many questions about bankroll. And so I wrote a 20-page, I guess, what do we call it, a monograph? I've written a 20-page monograph on bankroll, right? Because it's a common question. You can get it at jonathanlittlepoker.com slash bankroll. We try to answer the common questions. I get common questions about um, online poker for Americans. So I made a video, uh, jonathanlittlepoker.com slash USA. So anyway, you learn to answer the common questions. What's the most valuable information pertaining to playing $1,000 sit and goes? Make last longer bets. Make heads up last longer bets. I know that I make roughly half my money from those from heads up last longer bets. You sit down, you find the guy who looks like he wants to gamble, you say, hey, you want to make a last longer bet? Heads up. He'll say, yeah, sure, how much? You say, 5K. And he'll say, either. Usually say, no, let's do 1K. That's fine. Or sometimes he'll say, sure. Or sometimes he'll say, let's make it 10K. And you say, okay, sure. And then um, play 10K heads up last longer. What podcast do I listen to? I like um, This Week in Startups. I learned a lot about business from that one, featuring Jason Calacanis. I like the Gary V podcast. I don't know what it's called. I like the Tim Ferriss podcast. I like Planet Money. I like Freakonomics. I like um, I like businessy related podcasts, business related podcasts, and general self improvement podcasts. Also, listen to some Magic the Gathering podcast, but not many. What are the top three common problems I see from my students? Go to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash blog and read all of that. It was my last job before going pro. I worked at an airport fueling airplanes. Why are you not getting rich quick? Well, you're not trying hard enough. It's easy to get rich quick. I mean, if you try to get rich quick, you can get rich quick like, I don't know, one out of 100 times in poker. It's a pretty good rate, really, if you think about most other things. Um, you've been card dead. You have six big blinds. Well, that's a problem. The guy who raises another one shoves. You have fives. Just fold. Whenever there's a raise and a shove, and when a spot where you're calling it off effectively, the fives are going to be in pretty bad shape. But you should not get down to six big blinds, and usually you're not card dead. If you blind down to six big blinds, you screwed up sometimes. And, um, or usually you screwed up, because there are going to be many spots where someone min raises, you can jam for like 12 or 15 big blinds, and that guy's going to fold. I'm the best podcaster on YouTube. So, I'm not exactly sure what a podcast is. It seems like that term gets looser and looser every year. If I podcast is just a showmaker, then I guess I am a podcaster. To be fair, I do have a podcast called Weekly Poker Hand. In my mind, a podcast is a very regular show in both video, in, in definitely audio form, but often video form. If you're making a show only in video, or it's necessary that it's a video, I'm not really sure that's a podcast. I guess if it goes out to a podcast player. It is a podcast. Maybe that's the definition. Can you get it on a podcast player? And if you can, then it's a, it's a podcast. Anyway, thank you. I'm not exactly sure what I do. 
kind of hard to, to say exactly what I do. I have a business advisor who, whenever I first met him, I was going through all of the things that I have going on. We have books, podcasts, this show. We have weekly, po- we have um, Jonathan Low Poker, the blogs there. We have poker coaching. We have various other um, things like backing companies, et cetera, et cetera. And he's like, holy hell, how do you keep up with all this? <laughs> it's like an incredible amount of stuff. He's like, do you have this stuff written down anywhere? I'm like, no, I just do it. He says, um, well, you should, uh, should definitely get it written down in case something happens with your brain. But we do a lot of stuff, and that's okay. I don't mind. I like it. Dean Nelson says, this is regular. This is regular. I don't know if this is actually a podcast. Is this a podcast then? I don't know. It probably is. I don't view it as a podcast, but it probably is. I guess, I mean, hell, it's regular and it goes out to podcast apps, so I guess it is. Nickel says, a podcast is a recording of a radio program or a video that somebody can download from the internet. So really, any, anything on the internet is a podcast then. That's interesting. So essentially, whatever you want it to be. If you make um, one video and you make, you make one video a year, I guess it's a podcast. This has all come up because of the Global Poker Awards or whatever they're calling it, where they have horribly, horribly, horribly nominated people for a few categories. I was on the nomination panel, by the way, and they didn't give us much time to get in our answers. I don't know how long they gave us. They gave us three days or something, which is clearly not enough time. Um, Donnie Peters wrote an article, which I think was a really good one, essentially laying out that instead of having 130 people vote, you should have like 10 people vote, and you should really vet those people. Make sure they really care. Make sure they do their diligence. You need to essentially interview the people over and over and over again and um, ensure they really want to do it. And like this year, someone mentioned Jason Somerville was up for Streamer of the Year, yet he almost did not stream at all last year, right? And he compared it to, like, Kobe Bryant getting Player of the Year for 2019. Yeah, he's a great player, but um, is he Player of the Year? No. So it's um, horrible, horrible miscategorizations. I mean, I know, like, Brad Owens makes a great uh, video blog. He was, I mean, I voted for him, but... You know, he's not splashy. He's not flashy. He has tons of views. People love him. But it um, seems like the, the way the structure is set up is you're kind of... Well, people will vote for people they know, but they don't actually know what the people they know do, which is kind of confusing, right? Like, people don't know I make this show, and that's fine. It doesn't bother me. I'm not out to try to get accolades. I'm trying to help people. But anyway, what is a podcast? What is a stream? What is a video blog, right? Right? Who knows? The problem is they have not defined it. Are you playing many tournaments or cash games? No, neither. I had a baby. He's three months old. You just heard him screaming. Let's see. How often do I do this on YouTube? Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9 a.m. Eastern. For about an hour. You need to link us when you need us to vote. Uh, Jarvie, it's not a voting thing. It is a... It's a panel voting thing. It's not um it's not a thing, it's not a popularity contest. Lex and Scraggy have been doing work on streams. I mean, I don't watch I don't watch any poker streams, honestly. I watch literally none. The only streaming I watch is Magic the Gathering. I think poker streams are actually pretty bad for educational content, unless it is very, very clearly geared towards education. But no one does that because you often want to charge for these things. You also don't want to make them one time. The idea of presenting something one time and it vanishing or being lost and buried in a million streams is kind of a terrible idea, honestly. So it's entertainment, right? And, you know, in my mind, education is entertaining. And goofing off and complaining and celebrating and all that, that is not entertaining. And that is what most poker streams are. They're just straight up watching someone play the game. And watching someone play the game, I don't know, it's not, I don't like it. <laughs> I, I play the game myself. I don't need to watch somebody else play. So I, I am horribly not up to speed on what a good streamer is or who are the good streamers because I don't watch them, right? And to be fair, I was on the nomination panel, and it's not fair to ask me who is a good streamer because I've watched literally, what, one hour of streams over the last year? So am I, am I the right person to ask? No, I'm a horrible person to ask. Do I currently live in Vegas? No, I live in New York City. 
Most people watch for entertainment rather than to learn. That is definitely accurate, Lewis. The problem, though, is that a lot of people who come to me, I ask them what they do to study. These are like very new players. They say, oh, I like watching, insert some random dude on Twitch. And then it turns out their idea of study is to go home after work, have three beers, and watch somebody stream. And that's just like, if you think that's studying, you are, you're a stonefish is what it amounts to. And it's good that these people realize this is good. They found me because I can help them actually improve their games by studying as opposed to just goofing off. But if you goof off all the time, you're not going to get any better. That said, like Lewis says here, a lot of people don't care about getting better. Overloads and misinformation. That's definitely true. Um, you love the old WPT video, WPT video I put out of Mattisau. Well, good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, it would be good if you could watch me play online. You can. Go to pokercoaching.com. And that way, it's not just me playing in real time, because then you can't actually explain anything. It's me explaining the thought processes after the fact so that you know all the decisions that go into my head. Watching someone play in real time is not a great way to learn, unless you can pause the video and stop it and rewind it, etc., etc. Watching live is just... It's just not a good way to learn. Sorry, I don't know what to tell you. It's just not... A, there are many, many better ways to learn. Uh, let's see. Do I anything else to say about the World Series? Oh, find the bathrooms. The, um... Bathrooms are very difficult for men to find during the World Series. They do close some of the ladies' restrooms and turn them into men's restrooms. But the most ideal bathroom, I think, is probably the one at the pool. So at break, you get up, you leave. They usually get like 20 minutes. Um, you walk out the area. Eventually, you'll get to almost the casino. Turn left, you go right into the pool. Walk straight from there, you get a little bit of fresh air as fresh as it can be, and go to the bathroom there. That's, um, there'll be no line, no wait. You get to go outside, get to stretch your legs. It's pretty nice. How do I not go crazy from these stupid questions every little coffee? Um, I realize everyone is asking questions that they think are reasonable. And I try to help people. Who made the highlight video of a little coffee? A guy named Justin. One of my students, he came to me to help with social media, and he's been doing a fantastic job. Do you recommend playing Mega Satellites or Single Table Satellites? It depends on your skill set. Which pros do you hate? Um, I don't really hate anyone. Some people are certainly annoying, but I don't care. Any giveaways coming? Yeah, we're going to be giving away some seats to the World Series of Poker Big 50. I think we're going to give away three of those. We're going to be announcing that very soon. There's like a tiny chance to give away a main event seat. That's expensive, though. I can give away $1,500. It's starting start to get pricey to give away $10,000. You heard um, some people saying that they play differently when streaming. That's another problem with the way a lot of people do it is they, they're out to spread information, misinformation. I mean, that's really what I'm out to look. I'm out to spread good information and help people. Almost everyone out there is really looking to get popular and then ride popularity to not having to actually play a ton of poker. And... I think it's just, it's just like horrible. It's legitimately horrible. The idea of I'm going to play differently when people are watching me and then I'm going to try to make money off of this is it's pretty, pretty shady. But, you know, some people are shady. It's known that a lot of people are shady. And if you get involved with people who are shady, you should expect them to be shady to you. It's just, it's fine. Right? I mean, if you know what you're signing up for, just make sure that whenever someone does tell you bad information like, Invest all of your money in gold, or spend all of your money on satellites, or have 15 beers at the poker table. It doesn't matter, or, you know, whatever. Insert all these dumb things people can tell you to do, then... Oops. I forgot. I have to call in five minutes. Um, watch out for the shady people. Lots, lots, lots of shady people. You need to find people who are good humans, who are accurately, or, or who are trying to help you. Rumors about your pouches. Patches, where do I get them? Well, you're going to be able to send me your address and I'll send one to you in, in the near future. B. Paris plays, honestly, in your opinion. I think B. Paris is a very good example of someone who plays well. Do you use any mind coaches? Elliot Rowe and Dr. Trisha Cardner. All right, then. I have to go now. I have a call. In um, five minutes, I needed about 15 minutes to prepare, so here we are. All right, have a great day. Good luck. Enjoy yourselves. 
don't know what we're going to talk about on Friday, but we'll figure that out. Yeah, so that's it. Go to PokerCoaching.com, get a completely free trial. One of the things I just suggested, if you're going to the World Series or if you're going to play poker ever, you need to study ahead of time. If you do not study ahead of time, you're going to get crushed. And I don't want you all to get crushed. I want you all to thrive. I want you to succeed. I want you to do well. All right, have fun. Good luck.